All right, guys, I've got this uh, little bonus episode for you today. And what I'm doing here is I'm introducing you to the founder of the charity platform that I like to promote on this show uh, with these charity projects. His name is Gret Glyer. Um, I really like what he's doing. And uh, I think I'm going to let him mostly speak for himself, but I I just wanted to give you an opportunity to get to know the people behind this. Uh, It's really a beautiful thing that they're doing, trying to spread joy and charity around the world. And I really just uh, appreciate their methods in doing that. So yeah, I will uh, provide you plenty of links on where to find Donor C and and, uh, how to keep up with Gret and what he's doing. So yeah, without further ado, I will see you this upcoming Thursday for our regularly scheduled program. But uh, until then, enjoy this bonus episode with Gret Glyer. Hey everyone, my name is Gret and I am the CEO of Donorcy, an app that helps people see where their money goes whenever they make a donation. Okay, and so... in this program, I try to give people sort of the backstory on my guests, and, and normally it's musicians, but I think we can stick to the uh, similar format. So why don't you tell the guests a little bit about your upbringing and what kind of got you into uh, doing this uh, life of service here that you're doing with Donorcy? Sure. So, yeah, I grew up in a very wealthy area. I The, the, the county that I'm, I, I grew up in was a, is the second wealthiest county in the United States. And I went to a private school and I went to college. My college tuition was paid for by my parents. I just, I just grew up in a pretty affluent place and, and I didn't know it. I thought I was just like a normal person. Um, and then when I was, uh, I think when I was in ninth grade, I went to Kenya on this like safari, like vacation with my family. And that was the first time I realized that there are people who live very different lives than I had been living. And, um, and that really stuck with me. And then when I was, when I went to, when I graduated from college, I started working a desk job and I did that for about a year and it just didn't feel very meaningful. Uh, I, I wanted to do something more with my life and I wasn't, I wasn't finding a lot of fulfillment in that lifestyle. So that was when I decided to quit my job and I picked up and I moved to Africa, Malawi, Africa, a very small country in the southeast, certain part of the continent. And from there, I started doing poverty alleviation work and I spent the next three years doing that. And then I started Donorcy and that's where I am today. Okay. Now, Malawi, that's one of the poorest countries in the world, correct? Yep. It's always in the bottom five. And like in 2014, it was the poorest country in the world. So it's always kind of like fluctuating down there, um, depending on how, how bad of a year they have. Sure. And, and from what I understand, it's one of the only countries that hasn't been really torn with civil war, if I remember correct, right? I mean, they're yeah, a pretty peaceful country. Very impressive. Mm-hmm. Very peaceful. Yeah, that's, that's very impressive that you know that. I, I've never met someone who's, who's brought that up before, but yeah, they've <laughs> never had that before. They've, they've never had civil war. Yeah, yeah, but from what I understand, the biggest contested uh, area is the uh, uh, it's it's a large lake that divides Malawi and uh, I can't remember the other country that uh, shares borders with it. Yeah, but, Mozambique would be the other one. Okay, um, so so can you tell us any one particular story or or anything that sort of uh, triggered your desire to help these people like was it any sort of interaction that you had with uh, the natives there yeah i mean there was a lot of interactions the the first one that i had that like really the first time i ever when i first got there to malawi you know when you think of africa you think of like grass that shots dirt floors or whatever like mm-hmm. but the, the reality is that they have grocery stores they have um hospitals they have all these like di- different things and so uh when i was when I first got there, I was teaching at this like international school. They had like an Olympic sized swimming pool and I taught in like these classrooms with air conditioning and stuff like that. And I did that for like two months before I really like ever got outside and, and outside of the walls of that campus and did something um, more like location specific. So when I, I remember this guy blessings, he came and he, he brought me and he wanted to show me this, like he wanted to show me something. He's like, I told him if you ever need help with anything, let me know. So this guy blessings took me out to this like remote village took like 50 minutes to get out there and he introduced me to this lady who was this elderly lady who was super skinny like skin and bones 
and she was homeless and um, the it was it was October so rainy season was coming in the month and if she didn't get a house in time she was going to be in big trouble so he asked me to to fundraise a house for her and I had already committed to doing it before I knew how much it cost so I asked him how much is it going to be because I mean this lady's homeless there's no one who's going to do anything about it and I'm the only one with the capability to do it I'm the only one who's like offered myself the blessings to help this lady out so I don't know how long, how much is how much it's going to cost to build her a house and I asked him and I'm expecting him to say something like 10 or 15 thousand dollars and I'm wondering where I'm going to get the money to do that and he says it would cost 800 bucks to build her a house um, wow. and when he told me that I knew I could fundraise it um, relatively quickly right. you know especially with my my home the where I come from back in the states I mean that that's not a lot of money to the people I to a lot of my friends uh, and family so um, I think that was the first interaction but there's there's been several that have really drove home the point that um, that there there are people living very different lives than, than I had the privilege of living growing up Sure. And that is one thing that I like to uh, tell my listeners when I'm uh, promoting the charity projects on mm -hmm. Donor C. I say, yeah. you know, $5 doesn't seem like a lot. And I think most of us can afford to just throw at least that much at, at one of these projects. And, mm -hmm. and five, five or $10, that, I mean, that really goes a long way uh, comparatively uh, what it does here in America versus what that kind of currency can do uh, to get resources over in Africa. Yeah, for sure. So when I was that lady, her name was Rosina, the lady we built a house for. Um, one of the things I, I didn't mention was when I met her, she had not eaten any food in a week. Oh, wow. And so blessings told me, you know, like she's really hungry and she needs a house. And I said, well, like how much is it going to cost to feed her? And, um, so the, to, to buy enough food for her for an entire month, it cost seven bucks. This is like wow. eating a week, and all of a sudden she's got three square meals a day for seven bucks wow. for a month. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, what you're telling your audience is totally. I mean, you just got you have to get outside. You have to you have to allow yourself to realize like when you're looking around at your friends and the people you hang out with and the people you look at on Facebook, you're looking at people who are very similar to you. But mm -hmm. there's billions of people who live different lives than you. Billions with a B. Right. Um, and right. so yeah, I think that it's I think that what you're doing is is really great. Thank you. And. Um... I've got a friend who was in the Peace Corps, and he, uh, I think one of the big things he was doing was trying to distribute um, uh, medication and uh, and mosquito nets, uh, yeah. I, I believe, in the Congo. And mm -hmm. uh, so, so if I remember right, I remember hearing an interview with you on the Tom Wood Show, and you were you involved with the Peace Corps in some way? Uh, I was the the thing that happened with the Peace Corps is that they they banned their workers their volunteers from using our app. That was oh the, yeah okay. Um, so I was I was never involved with it. Um, they I, I'm the the there's jury still out on why on why they do this. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of speculation. There's a lot of probably political reasons behind it. But yeah, the Peace Corps uh, doesn't let their workers use the Donor C app, which to me, I mean, I could go. You, you can listen to the Tom Woods interview, but I could I could say a lot about that. Yeah, I can uh, I can link to it just on the show notes if people are interested. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that's really peculiar because it seems like it doesn't affect. It, it takes what all but uh, five seconds to take a picture and you know jot something up on on the app, right, for these aid workers. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. like, what, I, I don't understand why they would even uh, stop it from happening. Yeah, there, there's all sorts of reasons that they, they might say that. My, part of it, I think, comes up down to, like, the Peace Corps is a really large organization that demands a lot of control of the people that they have working for them. And so, like, any kind of outside resources or funds, they just they don't want anything to do with that. And, and like, to some extent, like, I can, I can almost see that perspective if – like the result of, of that policy wasn't that probably more people will die because like, for example, right. one of, one of the things that happens with donor C is like, this is a, a story that I tell a lot. There was this girl who was in, in somewhere in rural Africa. She's got, she's crossing a river, little, little girl, like seven years old and she's carrying water on her head for her family. She's coming back across the river and a crocodile comes up and bites her in the torso. And so these two guys jump into the water, they wrestle the crocodile away. He swims off. They bring the girl back on the shore. Had a, uh, there was a, a, a 
an aid worker in the village that that girl was in, and she took a picture of the girl and said, this girl needs medical attention urgently. And within a few minutes, the money that she needed for her medical bills was was paid. Right. And had that that girl's name was Nicole, who saved the little girl's life with donorcy. Mm -hmm. Had that been a Peace Corps worker, they would have not been allowed to do that, which is which is absurd. They would have been kicked out of the Peace Corps for taking the action to save that girl's life. Wow. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a frustrating thing, but I, I don't think. I don't think that they'll be able to keep that up for very long. Right, right. Especially if uh, people are out there talking about this. And, you know, I'd like to think of the Peace Corps as this, you know, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical of pretty much any government-run uh, organization, but that's mm -hmm. one of them that I've always considered to be, oh, all right, they're 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 actually out there doing something. It's not like they're bombing brown people in the Middle East and <laughs> I mean, know, yeah, committing mass murder. Yeah. So. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty good foreign aid thing if I if I had ever seen one. <laughs> mm -hmm. But but yeah. then you hear stories like that and it's like they're not even uh saved from the dangers of Yeah, it's bureaucracy. hard to get away from exactly. It's hard to get away from just becoming like a self-interested organization. When, when you, there's no checks and balances on you, there's no competition. You can just do whatever you want and not mm -hmm. many people want like you, it's kind of like awkward to criticize the peace corps, right? Cuz lots of people were right. in it, lots of people like it. They they are doing some good. So it's just, it becomes difficult. They, they become like almost uncheckable, which is dangerous. Right, right. Yeah, so uh, it, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit how Donor C works? I think we've touched on it a little bit, but why don't you kind of go mm -hmm. in depth and, and let us know exactly what the uh, guts behind it are? Definitely. So the way it works is what we're trying to do is create this two sided marketplace for humanitarian aid. And um, we just launched about seven months ago. So we're, we're a new startup that's just like growing really quickly. We're in 50 over 50 different countries at this point. Um, and we've had like, you know, we've had we've been as lucky as we can be for a brand new startup. And um, the way it works is we have these humanitarian aid workers, right? Like I Greg Lyer lived in Malawi for three years. And when I was living over there, um, I all the time saw needs, right? Like the little girl who, like the lady Rosina who needed a house or the little girl who was bitten by a crocodile, that kind of thing. And I always felt like fairly hopeless to do anything about it. Um, but now, so I, part of the reason I created the app was for people like me who are like living overseas and just want to do something. Um, and then the other reason I created the app is because there's lots of people in America who don't realize that um, the price of their Starbucks drink is also like, potentially a life and death amount to someone else on the other side of the world and they just don't know it right it's not that it's not that they're not generous it's not that they don't that they don't care it's just that it's hard for them to conceive and so donor is this video intensive platform where or picture intensive too where, where you go on the platform and you can see stories of real people in these in these real places living very real impoverished lives and you can make a big difference in their lives i mean you can literally be like a superhero to them mm -hmm. you, there's um one of these stories that people talk about with charity that one of the disconnects is like, let's say you're wearing your nicest suit. It's a $500 suit. You've got $200 shoes on. You've got your nice Apple watch on and you're walking along and you see this boy drowning and he's drowning and it's right there in front of you. Mm -hmm. What you do is you, you don't take off your watch and you're, you just jump in and you save the boy. You don't mm -hmm. care, right? You don't care about this stuff because right there in front of you, someone is suffering and is about to die and you can save them. And you do that and it's not a big deal. Right. You don't, you don't like wonder, oh, what, what am I going to do with all this the suit and stuff? So, but for that same amount of money, you can save people's lives all over the world, but you just don't think to do it. And it doesn't seem like that important. And there's like a disconnect there because it's, it's just too far away. And so what I was trying to do with Donor C is bring the drowning boy straight to you on your phone. And then give you the opportunity to do something about it right there on your phone. Um, and that's what when people download the app, they can do it. And we just added a feature where um, where it, you can sign up to give monthly. And if you're if you're the type of person who doesn't want to like search through and find a, a project, we'll pick the projects for you. And um, you just sign up and you give like thirty bucks a month, and we'll give uh, your money to three different projects, ten dollars to each each project every month. And you can sign up for different amounts. And what that does is you'll still get the updates. You'll still see, oh, wow, my $10 is building this lady house and it's providing mosquito nets for this, for these women who are suffering from, who used to suffer from sexual abuse and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And and you just get these updates every single month. So, yeah, that's that's kind of how Donorcy works. Yeah, and there are a lot of moving, uh, emotionally moving projects on there like that. I mean, uh, I just donated to one a week or two ago. And it was for mm -hmm. these, uh, about a dozen girls were rescued from human trafficking. And, mm -hmm. uh, 
And, and yeah, I mean, it, it, the project just went to go fund things like um, like clothes and book bags. And and, and yeah, I, I, it just seems like something so small. But to these yeah. to these girls who have nothing, that's it's all that's, they have. Yeah. yeah, it's and that's a huge gift that you can give them. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, it changes their lives. Right. Yeah, and I'm kind of curious. Uh, there's sort of uh, there's a, a movement in American culture on how we view charity, and I'm kind of curious to get your take on this. And it's uh, instead of sort of just giving people something to give them sustenance for the 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 meantime. And I noticed this on on Donorcy. There are a lot of projects that are going to actually give people tools to be productive mm-hmm. people for themselves rather than just like a month's worth of food, for example, which is great. I mean, if someone's starving, you need to get them food, right? But right. but there's a difference between just like, um, you know, making them dependent on the kindness of others versus giving them the, the tools through the kindness mm-hmm. of others, which uh, helps them be, uh, uh, you know, self-reliant. Yeah, so the, the, the buzzword that everyone's talking about and has been talking about for like, five to 10 years is sustainability. They want your, they want the thing, they want charity to be sustainable. They want, you know, you, you don't teach a man, to, you don't give a man a fish, you teach him how to fish, that kind of thing. And I think that what, what happened is for a long time, we were just throwing out fish and we were wrecking local economies. Like charities were just like throwing out fish and foreign aid was just going to like throw out fish. And it was, it was like wrecking the local economy. It was putting people out of business and it was putting like honest entrepreneurs in, in the area, it was demotivating them because the guy who's like making clothes all of a sudden can't make clothes for the local people around him because someone just dumped a bunch of T-shirts in their village. Mm-hmm. And so um, that was happening. And people were saying, this is not good. We need to be sustainable. And in my opinion, what's happened is we've like the pendulum was all the way on one side and now it's all the way on the other side. And yeah. I think somewhere in the middle is a good is a good balance. Sure. Right. Because uh, like I said, that lady Rosina. What am I gonna What am I gonna do? Just do nothing. Like she's right there in right. front of me. She hasn't eaten in a week. She needs the food. Right. And there's another perfect example of this is like um, any kind of disaster. So in Malawi, just a few months ago, uh, one of the projects that I I launched was um, there was some really bad flooding and several thousand people uh, lost their home. Like it was like when you think of like tidal wave coming in, entire villages underwater. Like it was like that. And of course, like that was not in the news. No one heard about that. These are just like remote people in a remote part of Africa. No one cares about them. So I launched a project and we raised $4,000 to get them like these emergency relief kits and to get them some, um, some temporary housing and some temporary food because they have no other, they have nothing else, right? So they will die. Um, so in, in certain situations, it's important to just like put aside the sustainability thing and be like, okay, how can we take care of these people who are in an urgent situation? Um, at the same time, like this sustainability piece is awesome. And, and obviously something that like the people who po- are posting projects on donor seat, they, in a lot of cases, they've been living in their respective communities for like 20 years. So they know how to help those people better than almost better than any like giant organizational charity. Right. Because they've been living with those people specifically and they know the culture there and they know the language and they can help them. And so, yeah, in, in that case, like um, anytime you can do something sustainable, obviously you should. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I totally I'm, I'm on board with that with that movement. Um but I also don't want to just like completely disregard anyone in an urgent situation because I think both are very important. Sure, yeah, and I think there's a sort of mindfulness to it. Um, there's a there's a guy named Justin Wren. I'm not sure if you're familiar with who he is. Uh, he's an it MMA. Sounds familiar. Yeah, he's an MMA fighter and he works for yes, Water okay. Four. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember hearing a story from him where uh, uh, the Tom's Shoes Company they. They basically, for every pair of shoes that you buy, they they donate so much towards shoes for people in destitute areas in uh, foreign countries. And yeah. they dropped off a bunch of shoes in the Congo because uh, that's where Justin primarily works. And mm-hmm. uh, and yeah, it, it put out the uh, the the local cobbler out of business because he didn't have mm-hmm. a place to make shoes. So I think that's that's something that we certainly have to have to consider but yeah i mean it's I, and it's probably hard for someone like myself i'll be honest with you i've i've uh, i haven't even really been out of the continental united states like i don't really know how this mm-hmm. kind of stuff affects people but i still want to help right so right. so so it's like it's it's a really hard place that it puts americans in because we don't have the optics right to mm-hmm. so we so we you know we do our best with what we've got, but when it gets up to, 
the CEO level, that's where you really have to be conscious of what the resources you're sending over there is actually doing to these people. So, yes, absolutely. And just like another note on the Tom's thing, I, when I was in Malawi there, I, I know of like this Tom shoes gave this like thousands of shoes to this one like distribution center in Malawi. And they just sat in a warehouse for years. Like I, I, I took some of the shoes, like the shoes that they give on the other side of the world. I have like a pair myself. They, they just were like sitting there doing nothing. So it, there's some questionable things going on there for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so, so in your time over there, uh, it, it, was there a certain point when you decided that, uh, that you needed to put this into a formal platform? Like, cause, cause I know you, uh, so with this this first story you were talking about with uh, getting eight hundred dollars, I'm sure that was pretty easy for you to resource. Mm-hmm. But but was there any sort of light bulb that clicked for you that you know uh, perhaps you saw other sort of sharing economy apps out there and maybe that inspired you to do this? So the inspiration came from like that home that we built. It was the eight hundred dollar house for Rosina. That was the first one we ever we ever built. But I ended up doing just like every type of poverty alleviation work you can think of. So like I did the mosquito net thing. Uh, mm-hmm. We provided. We did like farming. Um, we actually built over a hundred houses for different orphans and widows um, in the area. And then the last thing, my last year in Malawi, what we did was we we crowdfunded a hundred thousand dollar girls school, mm-hmm. and um, that was. That, and that's the sustainability piece that you talked about. I mean, that's going to have like lasting oh, impact yeah. for generations to come. And, um, it was, and it was 100% sustainable. So like, um, the, the way it works is it's a 50, 50 model. So there's 120 girls that go there. Half of them come from are just like vulnerable girls from the village who are paying just pennies to attend. And then the other half are girls from the city who want like a better education and are coming there to attend. And so we're kind of, oh, wow. um, able to keep the school going that way. And, when I built that school, it wasn't a big charity behind me. It was just me out there making videos and asking people to donate. And um, when I saw the power of using video to connect people to needs in the third world, that was that was the light bulb moment. That was when I said, "Okay, well, what if like what if it's not just a girls' school in Malawi? What if it's like fighting sex trafficking in Thailand? What if it's mm-hmm. working in the slums of India? How can we get this this type of?" Uh, procedure or this type of relationship going on all over the planet that's what mm-hmm. i wanted to do and so um it was actually while i was fundraising for the school i had i had conceptualized donor c and i started working on it and getting the venture capital for it and so i was able to as soon as when the when the girl school was launched a few weeks after that after that um i was able to launch donor c almost in like success, succession mm-hmm. and i think that momentum helped um helped us out a lot sure uh so one one criticism that i've gotten for uh for these charity projects that i'm promoting um is is that oh well there's there's all of this this pain and suffering in your own country why are you working so hard to to help people abroad you know which Mm -hmm. to me is rather rather silly because uh even the even the the poorest folks in in america are uh you know have access to resources that are much better than than what you could get over there. So I, I just don't see how um, how helping someone abroad takes away from people who are helping here. So what would you say to people who have this sort of uh, uh, tribalistic uh, inclinations towards charity and, and are sort of turned off by helping abroad? Um, I would encourage them. I mean, the reality is that they have no idea what they're talking about. But the, hmm. the um, for every... We'll put it this way. There's a million different ways I can describe this, but there's a direct correlation between obesity and poverty in America. What that means mm. is the uh, the more overweight you are, the more likely you are to be poor and vice versa. Um, that is a very, very different reality than the rest of the world. Sure. And um, the other thing is for every like homeless person, for every veteran, for every, whatever whatever it is that you're thinking of that is is suffering in America, they have like 20 different charities to choose from here. There sure. there is a, an oversaturation of people willing to help Americans, and sadly there's there's not many people who care much for the third world. And I I actually blog about this a lot. Like I I think that um, people treat those living in the third world as if they're like like less than human, just like totally. They don't count. They have they have different standards than the rest of us, and um, I mean they're they live in 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 tough situations. And it's not like 
no one has to help anyone necessarily, but all, but what people need do need to like conscientiously realize is that if you're living in America, there's a good chance you're living in the global one percent. You're in the top one percent of income earners on the entire earth, and it's not like there and and the people living in poverty are living on a tiny fraction of what the people in America are living on. So you've got the people in America. If you make thirty thirty four thousand dollars a year, you're in the global one percent. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, half of the population, half of the population of the world, billions of people, is living on less than two dollars and fifty cents a day. Right. Um, and so, like the the capacity for people in America to significantly improve lives overseas is the thing that people should be conscious of. Like, okay, sure, you can help people in America do that, but just, I mean, just think about like if you could spend ten dollars a week changing someone's life in some other part of the world, like, why would you not do that? And if, just sure. put yourself in the situation, like, what if what if it was reversed, right? You were so lucky that you were born into America. What if you were born into Somalia? What if you were mm. born into uh, North Sudan? What, like, what, these are, it is not fair that mm. you got the life lottery ticket of being born into one of the best countries on the planet. So just think about what you can do to help these people um, who did not get the same benefits that you did. Right. And, and that's something I bring up a lot with folks is, um, is that at some point you have to just admit that you got incredibly lucky by being born here in America and were afforded mm-hmm. uh, a surrounding that, uh, you know, has a very good economy and, and all the resources that a person would need. Uh, yeah, stable which, government, clean water, electricity, yeah. internet. I mean, the list goes on. Which law we, enforcement. We we obviously we take for granted, and it's almost like a double edged sword. Like we almost get so soft, you know that <laughs> that we forget. <laughs> yeah, we that, do. That we forget that uh, how how vulnerable how vulnerable humans really are in our mm-hmm. natural environment, and and yeah. you know just how fragile and and valuable life is. So. Yeah, we live in an incredible society. Like this is what, what is happening in America. Like the the are like paved roads and being able to dial a three digit number and have people come and rescue us. You know, but like this is like a, an amazing thing that's happening. It's it's very unlike what was happening the rest of history or in the rest of the world. So it's a we're we're very very fortunate. Sure. All right, Gret. Well, uh, I've taken up enough of your time. You've been very generous with me. Uh, so. So yeah, I'd kind of just like to give you an opportunity to tell the listeners any parting thoughts here. Sure. I would say um, one of the best things that has ever happened to me is I, is I put myself in a situation where I allowed myself to get outside my bubble. The bubble or, or the fish tank you live in is just like the people around you that you normally interact with. And anytime I expose myself to people who think differently or people who have very different lives, that has always been a benefit. So whether you do that through donorcy or through some other means, I would encourage your listeners to have a chance of doing that because it will it will be a huge personal benefit to them. All right. Cool. All right. Thank you very much for being on uh, Subversion. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. All right, guys, thanks for listening. And uh, now you see why I like uh, dealing with Donor C. It's run by a good guy, doing good things. So you can find in the show notes for today uh, places where you can find Gret, and I will give you links to uh, Donor C. Also, download their app, and you'll see just how easy it is to uh, give to people. And they will give you notifications, and uh, I give you all the gratification of donating. So thanks.